Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we're joined by uh, Chris Shavako from Shavako Capital in Atlanta. This does such a great job, brings a lot of market history, market awareness to the table. He's got some great long-term charts to help us put this last year into proper long-term context. Today, the S&P really rotating around the 3,800 level in the last couple hours, settling in just below there uh, for the close. So overall, finishing a little stronger. Energy communication services leading the way. The FANG trade back emerging along with energy to push things higher, but small cap's doing just fine as well. So what does this mean overall for the long-term trajectory of stocks? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny but cold Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we try to make sense of these markets through the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, investor psychology, all that good stuff, focusing on the message of the markets. You know, there's so much uncertainty. I feel like we've been saying that for a while, but this week, uh, more than ever, you have uh, Janet Yellen with comments this morning. We've got uh, the inauguration coming up tomorrow. Um, you know, a lot of earnings coming out on the, in the financial sector. We have Netflix coming out uh, here shortly. So a lot of potential catalysts for stocks to move uh, either way. And, and in general, I think what charts allow you to do is focus on what the markets themselves are telling you. And, you know, when I'm looking at price, breadth, and sentiment, sort of the three main components of the macro toolkit for me, I'm seeing a lot of uh, positive signs, right? I mean, the trends are positive and we're gonna see that when we look at some of the charts. There are, there are stocks that look exceptionally good. There are stocks that look pretty good. There are not a lot of stocks that look really bad. And I think that's a, that's a telling uh, a condition for us. We have some great guests along the way. Chris Shavako from Shavako Capital is joining us today. Uh, we had such a great interview with him on our Behind the Charts show. Uh, that was last year. If you missed it, we just uh, put it on our, uh, on our channel again. Uh, this week, you can go to our YouTube channel and check it out. But it, it's a masterclass in how to think long term as an investor. I'd encourage you to check it out. Wednesday, tomorrow, we have Joe Rabel from Rabel Stock Research. And then on Thursday, Sam Burns from Mill Street Research. Uh, Joe Rabel is a great stock picker. I always appreciate uh, hearing his take on things. Sam Burns, more of a macro strategist like others that we've brought on. I love talking with people who are not primarily chartists, not technical analysts, and seeing how their perspective, how their macro take lines up with what I'm seeing in the chart. So it should be a really good uh, set of guests for us this week on the show. Let's get to our market recap. I did want to start with a poll that we asked you over the weekend. The question was, what time frame do you use most often for charts? I give you four choices, intraday charts, daily charts, weekly charts, or monthly charts. 72% um, of you, an overwhelming majority said daily charts, which sounds about right given the time frames. hearing, you know, from most of you where you're aimed at. I think that's about right. And if you're looking, you know, three to six months down the road, one to three months down the road, something like that, I, I think that's the, the right answer. If you're looking longer than that, though, I'm concerned that only 9% of you said weekly charts. And I know that many of you out there are longer term investors and are thinking more structurally big picture about things. If that's how you would uh, describe yourself, I would encourage you to start with the weekly charts a lot more than you may be. Uh, because the time frame, you know, the charts you look at should all be based on the time frame. What what questions you're trying to answer, how you're trying to win this game. And if you're looking months and years down the road, I would start with weekly charts and then add the daily charts as more of a uh, confirmational tool. When I work with financial advisors looking at longer term asset allocation, we spend a lot more time on weekly charts for that reason. A number of you said intraday charts. And if you caught it last week, I think this was on Friday show, I want to say, we were talking about Bitcoin cryptocurrencies and the importance of looking at the hourly chart as opposed to the daily chart, just because the volatility uh, had gotten so extreme that I, I, I feel like from the daily chart, all the action is compressed. So looking at the hourly chart was a little more, uh, was a little more uh, valuable. So I would encourage all of you, regardless of where, where, what your time horizon is, all four of those time periods, intraday, daily, weekly, and monthly, could certainly have a place in your process, depending on what you're trying to do at that moment. So make sure you think about the different time frames uh, at play and how your time frame lines up and relates to some of the others. 
Let's review what's happened with the markets today. As I mentioned, the S&P really rotating around that 3,800 level, uh, finished toward the highs of the day, which is a nice follow through after uh, Friday's uh, sort of sell off. Obviously, we had the, uh, the holiday yesterday, so no trading. Um, we can see that uh, stocks resumed their uptrend. Uh, the NASDAQ 100 really leading the way higher, 1.5% uh, up uh, for the NASDAQ 100 and the NASDAQ composite. Mid caps and small caps also did just fine, small, then mid, then large. If you look in order of returns today, the VIX back uh, to around 23. Looking at some non equity asset classes very quickly. Uh, bonds actually finished just a little bit stronger today, really improved through the course of the day. They started out uh, low and then improved. The dollar weaker, uh, using the UUP, you know, that weak dollar thesis, strong gold weak dollar is something we've talked about long-term for a while, but you've really seen some, uh, you know, some, uh, some strength emerging on the dollar chart. And that stronger dollar, weaker gold uh, scenario could certainly play out for a little bit. Uh, overall, though, I think that trend of weaker dollar and, uh, and stronger gold, I would expect to, uh, to rematerialize here at some point, but, 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 but certainly taking a bit of a, uh, of a pause here. On the commodity side, gold was actually stronger today, uh, as well as silver up uh, even more. Uh, the energy sector, number one, and you can see that oil prices improved uh, just fine. Looking quickly at cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin chopped around quite a bit, but uh, ended essentially where it started, uh, around 36,650. Looking at a daily chart of the S&P 500, you know, I think this trend line is a really important one. You know, I'm not a huge trend line person. If you look, I, I draw trend lines on here less as a trading system, less as an actionable point, but more as a visual guide. For me, trend lines have always been a way of visually quantifying the trend, right? The trend has character. The trend has a certain pace. It has a certain rate of return. And on a log scale chart, a trend line sort of gives you a steady percent change uh, in, the, uh, in the asset, in the stock, in the ETF, in the index. When it breaks a trend line that tells you that things are, things are changing, and I always talk about a change of character in a chart, something that is constructive and, and it changes a bit, goes into consolidation mode. So this trend line, starting with the October low that reconnected with the low really at the end of last year, beginning of this year, we then retested that um, on Friday's session. That was pretty much the, the close for the day. We bounced back up there. So we're now creating this trend line with three points. It's a pretty good trend line. I'd love to see how stocks continue to go on there. If and when we break through that, that's when you look left in the chart. That's where you look for key support levels and, uh, and potential, uh, potential uh, pullback points. The 50-day moving average is around 36.75, which isn't too far from where we're, at, uh, where we're at right now, about 125 points below current levels. So on a breakdown, that would be the, you know, the very first thing I would look for to see if that's able to hold. And if so, then uh, it's a little more constructive. We break there. You really have to start thinking a little deeper about uh, some of the risk assessment. But overall, certainly stocks in, uh, in, in bullish mode, breadth characteristics have certainly, have certainly confirmed that. Let's look quickly at some, uh, some other data points from today. So we have energy leading the way 2% higher, followed by communication services and technology. One of the FANG stocks reporting uh, as we speak, Netflix. So seeing how that actually plays out uh, will, be, uh, will be an interesting data point. See what that means for the rest of the week. A lot of financial stocks uh, reporting as well. So I think that's a, a, a potential area um, for improvement. You know, when I'm looking at stocks that are improving today, you're seeing a lot of biotechs uh, on here, things like Gilead and, uh, and others. Uh, you know, we talked about the healthcare sector last week and, and the week before, if I remember right. That's one of those that I think a lot of people have sort of written off mentally because there have been, it's sort of been the energy and financials trade that's working, or it's the technology communication services trade, the FANG stocks, and which is which. Healthcare is just kind of chipping away with a nice uh, string of performance. The chart actually doesn't look that bad. Actually, it's looking kind of constructive and looking at things like uh, biotechs and others that you may have you know, written off for a little bit, uh, maybe worth, uh, worth revisiting a little bit. Let's look at a chart of uh, Alphabet here. We'll look at uh, Google. You know, the FANG stocks overall have, have long-term been very, very good. On a relative basis, though, in the short term, look at the fourth quarter, uh, a lot less attractive. And when you look at the chart of Netflix, it's really more range-bound. When you look at the chart of uh, Alphabet, arguably really more range-bound, especially if you look at the last uh, at the last uh, three months or so. So these, what, and what I mean by range mount, a clear resistance level, a clear support level, and we're within that range. Uh, Alphabet improving today up uh, over 3% outperforming the market, but still within this sort of rectangle. If I draw a rectangle around the previous uh, moves from around 1700 on the low end to 1850 on the, on the high end. It would be very interesting to me to see how the FANG stocks resolve out of this area. Are they able to break out? Do you see a stock like uh, Google get above 1850, move to new highs. You see Netflix 
uh, which as I mentioned, uh, coming up reporting, that is not the ticker, David, NFL. <laughs> If we look at Netflix, right, same, same sort of idea, right? Going back to July, you have this big range-bound rectangle, 580 at the top, sort of 460 on the lower end. We're really mid-range of that pattern. Do we get a positive uh, earnings win? Do we see the stock appreciate through the remainder of this week and, and get more to the upper end of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that range? Those stocks breaking out to the upside, I would say, would tell me to be a lot less afraid about the pullback that I think we could see uh, in January, February, just that you know, overdue pullback with the euphoric sentiment that I think could make sense. Um, you know, seeing them uh, fail there, seeing them get down and retest the lower end of this range, I think would tell me an increased risk of uh, stocks like this not working as much, stocks like this starting to, you know, continue to be range bound, flat to down for a little bit, uh, could tell us that it's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a vacuum of leadership. Uh, and, and then you have to look at things like energy and financials and see if they can continue to, uh, to push things uh, to the upside. Let's go back to our dashboard uh, very quickly, see what else we can, uh, we can do. In terms of stocks up the most, General Motors, the number one gainer in the S&P 500. So uh, that group, that group of automobile uh, manufacturers, uh, there's so many eyes on Tesla and what they're doing, but it's worth noting that there are other uh, automobile manufacturers doing just fine. But if you look at the list on the top, it's renewable energy equipment. This is solar, hydrogen names. These are, this is a group that has consistently been one of the top performers. It's internet semiconductors, these are more bellwether groups uh, doing well, which again, tells me overall the market in, in, in pretty decent shape. So we're, we're back to that strong price, strong trend, strong breadth, questionable sentiment. I say questionable because it's so positive, it feels contrary and negative. How do we manage all of that? Uh, we'll, uh, we'll consider that and, uh, and other things here when we get back from the break. We'll take a quick commercial break back with Chris Shivako from Shivako Capital. See you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. I'm Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to have you along the way as we review the markets on The Final Bar every weekday after the close. As a reminder, uh, give us a follow on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV. Uh, on our YouTube channel, put any questions you have right below the video that you're watching. Best way to get questions to us, as always, is via email, The Final Bar at StockCharts.com. A little later in today's show, we're going to do a mailbag segment. We'll answer some of your questions from over the weekend and uh, look forward to answering one of your questions in our next mailbag segment at the end of the week. So keep them coming, uh, shoot us an email with anything on your mind. I wanna welcome on my guest, Chris Shivako from Shivako Capital. Chris, it was so great to meet you uh, in Atlanta, which feels like a lifetime ago when we could all travel again, uh, but it's great to have you back. You do such a great job of, and I, I feel like you, you are so generous with your ideas on social media, on your YouTube channel. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on today. Well, I appreciate the invitation, and I think we have, well, I get excited about the charts. I think these are two very exciting charts we're going to cover today. So we're going long term. Obviously, the market's, you know, resilient here in January thus far, uh, and, and we continue to push to new highs. Orient us with what, what we're seeing here. What's your, what's your overall take? My overall take is that the big picture is probably better than most people believe, and this chart right off the bat tells you something about that. Look at the global Dow, January 2018. You hear a lot about the market being overextended. Before the US election, we were well below that high where your cursor is, well below it. And we are not extended from a base. Compare how far we were extended from a base at that point in January of 2018. Your base is all the way back in the 2015, 2016 window. Now we just exceeded the base in the last few weeks. January 2018 is an important point because if you look at a lot of charts, let's say QQQ divided by GLD, so tech divided by gold or the NASDAQ divided by gold, or uh, QQQ GLD, so stocks versus gold and stocks versus bonds. Sometime in calendar year 2018, those type of ratio charts peak, much like this chart here. And there's really no resolution in a bullish manner until relatively recently in calendar year 2020. So let's start at point one. We have the high in January of 2018, and that's when Bitcoin 
peaks, that's when a lot of your confidence peaks there. And it really doesn't resolve itself until after the US election. So all of this is still very, very relevant to the present day. Then when we come back up in early 2020, you can see in the global Dow here, we make a discernible lower high, which turned out to be helpful. And then we drop below the prior lows from calendar year 2019, 2018, and 2017. So typically you would say that's incredibly bearish. Those are bearish breakdowns. And this kind of ties into what you said earlier about multiple time frames. If you were trading a 60 minute chart and you had what's known as a false breakdown, you know that's bullish. So this is what we have here. At point three, we get a bearish breakdown and then a sharp intra-year reversal where we take all of that back. And by the end of the year, we're at point four. And we've exceeded the highs from January of 2018 and the highs from Q1 of 2020. That tends to be very, very bullish. And what that tells us is what we already know. At point three, we believe the world is ending and then the market changes its mind in a big way and you get the breath thrusts and you get all of the things that you would expect to see at the early stages of a bull market. What's kind of interesting about this, if you look at the low in October of 2020, which is right before the US election, if we go to the second chart and back out, that's an important point. That low right there coincides with the original peak in the global Dow that occurred in 2007, 2008, which was the end of that bull market. Holding that level at the US election and then once again exceeding the prior highs tends to be bullish. All of this ties into a much bigger theme. Also think about this, about the markets are so extended we're not discernibly higher in the global Dow than where we were in 2007. We were basically at the exact same level at the US election as to where we were in 2007. We're not extended from a base here. So as long as we can hold above that orange line and hold this breakout, really what it's doing for us is confirming the secular trend thesis from the US where the US markets, the S&P 500 broke above that 2007 peak in 2013. This is bullish for risk. And as long as this breakout holds, it tells us something really about every risk market around the globe. This is such a great set of charts, Chris. And I, and I love the perspective, right? Because I, I think when people talk about the market being overextended, really thinking about that last you know six to 12 months where it certainly feels like we've accelerated, but Put in proper context, we're sort of, you know, this is a, a broad base that we're now breaking out of. I'd love to just ask you very quick. We have about 30 seconds left. You know, so having said that, right, if the market is in good shape, if it does hold above this orange line and it's constructive, you've had energy and financials, which have come on pretty strong, obviously, uh, you know, toward the end of last year. But you have things like the FANG stocks that, that people are, are sort of tried and true places to be. Where would you be looking for leadership here in the coming months? I think you're looking more at a mid-cap, small-cap, RSP, equal weight S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't yeah. mean that the prior leaders are going to significantly lag, but you really need to look outside of the post-pandemic leadership group off of that low at 0.3 and expand yourself towards economically sensitive sectors. As you said earlier in the broadcast, everything looks good, <laughs> but some things are set up better than other sectors. That's well said. Chris, it's so good to have you on. I look forward to having you back on the show. Until then, hope you and those around you stay safe, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Fantastic. Look forward to doing all this in person very soon. Absolutely. Folks, that's Chris Shavaco from Shavaco Capital. As I mentioned in, in, uh, as I was introducing him, I learned about Chris from following him on social media and just being so impressed by the ideas that he was willing to share with everyone. If, you, if you've not followed him, I encourage you to follow him on Twitter. Check out his YouTube channel where he does a great uh, update that I, I think is very well uh, well regarded, but some great thoughts about putting this breakout into uh, proper long-term perspective. Let's continue on. I want to answer your questions from the final bar mailbag. As I mentioned earlier, we love to hear from you, in particular questions that are coming up in your normal process of analyzing the markets. Um, give us a, a shout over email, the final bar at stockcharts.com, something that you're looking at on your own charts, something you're hearing in the media or hearing from 
uh, you know, someone on social media, whatever, uh, and, and uh, let us know what you're looking at. We're happy to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment. Question number one, I have a question on the Fibonacci series. How do I use stock charts to make use of Fibonacci? Um, I'm trying to drag the Fibonacci retracements and getting confused as to where I place it, uh, overlay it on my chart. Uh, it's a really good question. And so here's what I would tell you. In general, the times when you want to use Fibonacci retracements, uh, th there are different ways and it's outside of the scope, unfortunately, of the time we have to go through all the different ways people use Fibonacci retracements, but they do use Fibonacci levels to project a market going to new highs. So uh, you, would, you would include it on the chart of the S&P to try to project uh, potential upside objectives as we continue to push higher. But where it's traditionally used is on a range bound market. Something like Peloton probably comes to mind as something that had you know, a really good run uh, into uh, the October peak and then starts to pull back. The general way you use Fibonacci is this is what you do. Um, below the chart, if you're using sharp charts, below the chart, there's an annotate button. Over here on the left, this opens this, uh, this toolbar. This one that looks like the little uh, uh, curvy uh, arc sort of uh, shape, click uh, Fibonacci retracements. And what you wanna do is select a high price and a low price. So you have to define what the frame of reference is. And what I would, what I would usually start with is a, 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 what you would consider a significant high and a significant low. You can start at either one. So here I'm gonna start at the low uh, from uh, uh, March and then take it to the high here. And what you can do is just drag the line right over and I can see um, I'm just lining up visually this peak uh, from October. I started at the low uh, here in March, and now I'm looking at the uh, the percentages. So this here, this first line, is a 38.2% retracement of that run. That's saying that's 100% of the move. This is 38.2%. If you're wondering why the lines are all sort of skewed at the top, it's a log scale chart. So the Fibonacci lines are going to appear sort of at the at the higher end, depending on how something's traded, because it's based on the actual price values and it's 38.2% of it. What you can see on the chart of Peloton and Zoom and others did a very similar thing. You had the run from March to uh, October when it sold off, it retraced about 38.2% of the way back down. And, and that you know usually provides some sort of support. That's where you'd expect support. If it holds, then you, know, you, you assume it's gonna return to the previous highs. If it breaks, then you go down to the next Fibonacci support level, you assume it'll go uh, down to the 61.8% retrace the level. If it breaks that, you can assume it can retrace 100% of the way down to the zero level. The Peloton is one of the better examples recently that I've seen because you can see after the peak, it retraced to 38.2% and then break, broke to new highs, retested that resistance level uh, here, resistance becomes support, and now it's trading back up. But actually coming down uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the peak here uh, today, uh, building on Friday's sell. So it'd be interesting to see if 140 is able to hold, that would be a key uh, level for Peloton. So that is generally how you do it. On ACP, a little different. You click on the toolbar on the left where you can uh, add uh, chart studies and then click and drag the Fibonacci retracement, same as I'm, uh, as I'm showing you there. That's generally how you would use it. If, if, if you miss that or if you need more, go to our chart school page on Fibonacci retracements. It'll give you some, uh, some further examples as well. Question number two, love all, watching all your stuff through stock charts, looking at your live folder there. Just curious as to looking at the chart for uh, SGEN with those last three bounces. Let me bring this up here, SGEN. Um, SGEN is a, a CGEN, it's a, it's a biotechnology name. Uh, would those last three bounces off the support level be classified as a triple bottom? Uh, thanks for your time. I think you're looking at uh, these levels right here, would that be considered a, a triple bottom? So, you know, uh, phrases like triple bottom and triple tops, I don't usually talk about them a lot when you're looking at regular price charts. Those are really valuable with point and figure charting. I kind of get away from that though, but I do focus for sure on support levels. And, and that's what I would certainly call it. Absolutely. I think you've identified a great support level around 165. This is a level that it hit here in late October, retested it there in November, again, in late November. Now it's come right back down to that, same, uh, to that same level, which coincided with the 200 day moving average, what I'd call a confluence of support. Those levels are holding pretty well. So when you think about risk reward, when it pulls back here, it's pulled back to a, an established support level. You have upside back to the previous highs. Overall, that's setting up pretty constructive. As long as this holds, as long as 165 holds, the chart's in pretty good shape. And I, I wouldn't mind assuming you get some further appreciation from here. If and when we break that, that's when you wanna start to think more negatively about potential uh, potential downside. So I don't know if I would agree with calling it a triple top, although it technically probably would be. I, I would consider it a support level. I think you've identified it well. 
Dave, great summary for the week. Can you clarify, as you call the crude oil label you use for the weekly summary as energy, so does it in fact include other items besides crude oil? That was probably a total uh, verbal fumble, but let's look at what we were talking about. I use this chart a lot for our weekly uh, update, and the labels are not updated uh, just yet, so it's probably not going to look super pretty just yet. I actually update them before the show to make sure they look right, so sorry that they're kind of still on Friday, but you were basically, I, I was pointing this brown uh, line and, and, and I probably called it energy, uh, which is incorrect. So that is actually the USO. On, on any of the charts that I show, the, the legend is going to show you exactly what it's telling you. I simplify labels and I probably oversimplify trying to, uh, you know, say something, you know, it's bonds, even though it doesn't really, you know, it's not just, you know, a particular, you know, it's a particular type of bonds, right? It's a, it's a treasury bond. It doesn't include corporate bonds. So I probably could be a little clearer on what I'm doing. That This that I use is the USO, which if you're a longer term investor, the USO is not a great thing to use because the longer you go, the USO disconnects from crude oil prices from the future because of the rollover and, uh, you know, the expiration you have to deal with with, uh, with futures. So long term uh, analysis, I would certainly use dollar sign WTIC, which is the West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil Future Price. That's a, that's a better long-term gauge. But day-to-day, -day, intraday, the USO is going to be a good proxy for oil prices, and that's why I tend to use it, looking at a one-week uh, change in prices. So yeah, brown is definitely crude oil in the form of the USO. Final question here, and then we have to wrap up. What should I use to track small caps, the S&P 600 or the Russell 2000, and I and I got this question earlier, so I just I, I created this chart for you really quick. You know, so the answer is it, it really I I would I would say they're a wash. The S and P 600 or 600 small cap stocks. The Russell 2000 has a much broader group. However, the smallest 1400 names in the Russell 2000 don't have as much of an impact. And I'm showing you right here the IJR, which is the S and P 600 ETF. I'm showing the rolling correlation of the S&P 600 and the Russell 2000. You can see it's consistently around 95 to 100% uh, you know, positive correlation. So overall, there are little times when they'll become disconnected uh, and not, but, but it's still a very, very strong positive correlation. So I would say unless you're a, an institutional fund manager and you have a benchmark to worry about, that's when I think you would think about the Russell 2000 in particular, because that might be your benchmark. But uh, for, for an individual investor, for a retail investor, for an advisor, I would say it's a wash and use, use either one. I tend to use the IWM, but the IJR is a, is a perfect substitute for most uses. That is our mailbag segment. Thanks so much for sending those questions and keep them coming. We'd love to hear from you. We need to wrap this show though. Go to the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one comes to us from my friend, uh, Mark Darriott from Cormark Securities. I've known Mark, I followed his work for a number of years. He was, uh, we were emailing over the weekend. He, he shared this chart of Bank of America versus Microsoft. We talked about, you know, um, financials versus technology, looking at the ratio of the XLF and the XLK. This is how he was doing it, looking at BAC versus MSFT. And the red dotted line in the background, do you know what that is? It's actually the 10-year yield. So if you wonder why financials are doing well and why something like Bank of America can be outperforming Microsoft, it's because yields are going up. And you can see the very strong positive correlation between 10-year yields, just interest rates, and uh, financials ability to outperform technology. Chart number two is uh, China in the form of the FXI. When you unadjust the data underscore FXI, you can see that this is broken to new uh, long-term highs. You can see the gap above the 49 level. So we've talked about the emergence of China, India, other you know, non-US markets, but especially emerging markets, but China really accelerated to the upside, outperforming very well year to date. And I certainly could see uh, further upside potential there. Finally, the chart in Netflix, you know, we have a lot of uh, earnings coming up uh, this week and, uh, and elsewhere uh, as we start to get into, uh, start to get, dig into the meat of earnings season. Uh, I would encourage you with a chart like Netflix to think about the uh, framework that you, uh, that you have in mind here. There's a rectangle you can draw from resistance using the previous highs and support using the previous lows. One of those has to break, but the stock has been in consolidation mode. I'd be very keen on seeing which way Netflix is able to uh, break. Just reporting uh, earnings after the close today, so see which way we can move. Uh, so far, it's been wait and see mode, so this could be a potential catalyst for future movement from here. Folks, that is our show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday for the final bar. I want to thank my guest, Chris Shavaco from Shavaco Capital, sharing some great long-term charts with us today. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. 
If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.